we are going to talk a bit about uh, over-the-air updates. So this is typically how uh, people develop uh, connected devices or IoT devices. So you start off by prototyping, production design, and then you get into some kind of release deadline panic towards the end before you get into mass production. And this is also where you typically start thinking about over-the-air updates. And uh, because you know that during this critical phase where you're almost there, uh, you make some mistakes. And now you need a way to fix them. Of course, this is where you should be thinking about uh, over-the-air updates and how to resolve them earlier in the process. So when you have a prototyping stage, you might want to test it out a little bit, or uh, especially when you're in production design, what kind of update strategy should you use for your application? It's really hard to retrofit these things. So what we see a lot at Mender, obviously we make an open source over the air updater, uh, but what we see a lot is that people build their own. And uh, I've divided them into three categories. Um, by the way, how, how many of you have built your own over the air updater? Just raise your hand. Like it's kind of like one third of you. Uh, and uh, how many would like to do it again if you had a chance? One, okay. Uh, but so this is generally also what we see, like people make it because they have to and it's a panic and uh, things go not as expected always. It seems like an easy problem. But the first version uh, is what I call the bricker, which is, uh, um, it's very short, um, and development time, and then you start to worry uh, and see the effects of, of it afterwards. So you see that uh, when you update devices, they lose power, they never come back online, they get shipped back to you, and you have to resolve this as a support case, for example. Uh, so you start out with some bash scripts, maybe, and, uh, and, and you work your way from there. Uh, then you have the honeypot, which is uh, more security related. So in this case, you might not be thinking about authentication when you download the update, for example. So if somebody is nearby, they're able to inject an update that was not supposed to go there. Uh, maybe there's plain text protocols and there's no signatures. Uh, actually, the Tesla had partly this problem uh, until 2016 when they got uh, hacked by some Chinese research company they did not have signature validation of their updates, so they were able to take over uh, a Tesla. <laughs> but it sounds like a basic problem, but even Tesla has this problem. And then you have the needy updater, which uh, is the one that needs a lot of attention because uh, you need to do it one by one. So uh, you have a device and then the only way to get software to it is through a USB stick and then maybe run some rescue mode and, and a shell script there. Uh, so obviously this doesn't work that well. Uh, it doesn't scale that well. Uh, so it, it gets done uh, less frequently than it should. Uh, and then why, why are these so hard problems? Well, it's basically because we work in a very rough environment in the embedded space, as you're probably familiar with already. Uh, the devices are remote. Uh, they are expected to live for a very long time in the field, maybe five, ten years. For cars, it's even longer, uh, maybe 30 years. And then you have these factors that, that make it hard. So, so it has to work every time because it's remote and uh, long lifetime. But then uh, the power is unreliable. Maybe it's running on battery. Uh, maybe there's a stupid user that unplugs it suddenly while you're doing the update. Why would he ever do that? And then uh, what happens when the device boots again after that? And you also have unreliable network, a public network, often wireless networks that are insecure as well. So it's a pretty harsh environment, as you know. And based on this, uh, we found some criteria that you should have as part of the update process. So it needs to be robust and secure, uh, integrate well with your existing environment because you probably have some way of building your software and developing your software already, and you don't want to replace all that just to get over-the-air updates to it. Uh, easy to getting started again because we're often in that 
right uh, bottom box there where you're in panic mode and you want to <laughs> enable updates somehow. And um, you don't want to spend too much time on this. And then, of course, you have bandwidth consumptions, especially for 3G networks. Uh, downtime during the update, this varies also by application. How long are you allowed to take your devices offline? If it's part of a telecom or a router network, this is uh, very important, of course, to have it very short, but it varies a bit. And then lastly is the update server. So being able to manage updates across a lot of devices is, is also important in order to uh, make it cheap to deploy a new update. So this is over the years after um, we've worked on this problem. Uh, we released the first version of Mender last year, so it's just one year old, uh, the first version of 1.0. Um, but we've developed this uh, workflow that you should follow if you're uh, doing over-the-air updates. So firstly, you do some kind of uh, detection that there is an update available through a secure channel. You do a compatibility check to make sure that the update is for this device, it works on this device, right architecture, and so on. Uh, you download it, do integrity check, make sure nothing is corrupted. Uh, check the signature, make sure it's authentic. Uh, you might also decrypt and extract it depending on if you need those, if you need confidentiality in your updates. Uh, and then usually you have some pre-install and post-install actions, um, but the most important one uh, and the one that only that you only think about when you're in panic mode is the install, because you, <laughs> you can see it's actually quite a, a small thing compared to all the other things you have to do. But after you install it, you need to restart it, you need to do sanity check, does the device work after you did the update? So one thing is if you get Linux to boot, but do your applications work as well? Uh, because otherwise it will be pretty useless to the end user. And then lastly is uh, maybe most importantly, what do you do if it doesn't work? So there will always be some way to resolve it. Uh, maybe ship the device back, but that's a quite expensive way. Uh, so what we advocate at least is to do, um, have some way to do um, automated rollbacks. Um, but that depends, again, how you do the installation. So some ways of installing, for example, RPM packages and things like this, you cannot roll back in general. Um, so quick intro. How many have, have used Mender? How do you? Oh, it's quite a lot. Four, five, six, maybe one third. Sorry? You looked at it. How many are aware of how it works? Maybe half of you. Cool. Welcome back, and uh, welcome to the, the rest of you. I'll give you a short intro of what it is. Um, so it has a client on a server. So you have this management server at the top here. And uh, you have the devices. It might be a bit small for you, but it's on the right hand side. Uh, no, it's on the left. I guess for you as well, yeah. Uh, so it's on the left hand side, the devices, and they will regularly pull for updates um, to the deployment server. And they will, uh, if there is an update that's ready, uh, they will get the answer, get this update. And then they will install it, as you can see at the bottom here. Uh, we have several partitions. Uh, so this is to enable the, the rollback that I mentioned in the previous slide. So. Um, so we have one partition uh, that's active and running. That's where your system lives currently. And then we update the other one. And why do we do this? Uh, so this is because if you lose power, for example, in the middle of the update process, you will still get back to the running partition. You wouldn't have altered anything of your existing system. And then you can try again to install the update. But if you have only one partition, then when you install the update, it might get half done and then you cannot boot anymore. So this is to enable uh, robust updates. And yeah, you can update anything you put on the root file system, including the kernel device tree applications. Um, so maybe we should do a quick demo. Now I have not started it, so it will take a little bit. Um, but uh, you can also try it yourself if you follow the getting started uh, 
we say it will take less than one hour to test it out, and uh, so far it's held through. So uh, I'll just see. We can create an account. Okay, so it's starting a virtual device here. Uh, you can see there's a Mender client there as well. Um, so right now it should be running on my local machine. Uh, all right, it worked. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the user interface that we have. It's running currently in demo mode, which means that you cannot <laughs> use it in production this way because it, uh, it uses a um, a shared key among other, uh, among other things, so it's it's very insecure. Uh, I hope you cannot connect to mine right now, but um, um, we do also have guidelines how to set it up properly. But uh, there's a couple, uh, there's three main areas to look at. So one is the devices, then you have the artifacts, which are the uh, which is the software basically that you want to deploy, and then you have the deployments where you kind of combine the devices and the artifacts. Um, let me see if I can upload one. So, how many of you use Yocto project for, okay, a lot of you, maybe 70%. Yep. Um, so we do have a meta layer and, uh, for, for Yocto. So if you add that to your Yocto build system, it will output a couple of extra files. So one file is the uh, has the suffix .mender. This is what I just uploaded. So you can see it here. But um, this is basically a root file system and it contains some additional metadata, like your checksum. The checksum, we need that in order to know sh be sure that we got all the bits, the build date, the size, and if it's signed or not. Um, so it's, uh, it's basically a raw root file system with, with some metadata around it. And this gets automatically built uh, if you use Yocto. Uh, we're looking to expand that. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later. But there you go. OK. So there's one device. This is started as part of the demo setup. Um, it's asking you to approve it because uh, I haven't added any trust about this device before. So the device has the key of the server, but the server doesn't know anything about the device. So um, there are other ways to approve this device. You can pre-authenticate uh, pre it also, but if you haven't, it will just ask you. So we provide some inventory information, um, but most importantly, the, the current software that is running. So it's, it's got a name, the software that you have on the device already. This, um, um, you can think of it like a version, but you can put any string there or revision. Um, and then we also collect some additional inventory about, uh, about the device. And this is completely configurable. So now I have a device and I have an artifact. So the last thing, yeah, you can see this pop-up, so I just ignore them, but they will try to help you uh, what to do next. Um, so we can create a deployment, we can um, use the artifact that we just uploaded, the root file system, and we do support grouping, so you can either do it to all devices or you can uh, create a group, but it doesn't matter much right now since I just have one. But um, this is the basic workflow, and you can see the reports as well. Uh, afterwards, and the status while it's ongoing, what what is happening? So, um, so it will tell you how long it takes. So this will probably take a couple of minutes. So we can resume. I guess it's not that interesting to watch a progress bar, um, but I'll switch back to the. We can resume here. Oh, do you have any questions, by the way, so far for this? One? Yep. Uh, so you're asking about uh, tiering the yeah, updates so that... 
Got it. So you have a um, you have an internet connection down to a building, let's say, and then you have fast connection within the building. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't have anything specifically to support that, but we use uh, HTTP, so it should be quite easy to set up a proxy, uh, HTTP proxy there. I haven't experienced uh, or experimented with it myself, but uh, should be quite straightforward. Um, yep. Okay, so the question is how much additional overhead is required on the client side? So um, part of this is uh, shown, I can maybe zoom it in. Um, so I would say the biggest overhead is that you have to have two root file systems. So there is some storage overhead. It depends like how, how big your root file system is, obviously. Uh, you can put, we also have a data partition, so your root file system could be 50 megabytes and your data partition like a gigabyte or something. Uh, so it, it depends on what, what you want to update. Um, but I would say that's the main thing. And then the client itself, I think, is about eight megabytes or something like that right now. Uh, yep. Right, so if you already have an updater, um, is there an easy way to transition into Mender? So uh, it is not trivial because um, we use this partition layout and that's the hardest part. And if you have a live system running and it doesn't have the, the partition layout, um, it is a bit tricky. I've heard about, I've not tried it myself, but there is a tool for this. Uh, Mm, where you can actually change the partition in a running system, but it's it's uh, <laughs> risky business. So uh, um, unfortunately, it's a bit tricky at that stage. But, uh, then you're good. <laughs> okay. Right, so if you only want to do updates, say, at night or something like that, uh, how can we support that? So uh, we have something called state scripts, which is partly covered, uh, I guess. It's a bit simpler um, or more generic version of the pre- and post-install actions, but uh, we have the ability to insert scripts between each stage here. So you can have a script before detecting the update. Um, and then you can implement any logic there to say, uh, if time is in this interval, uh, skip this or, or just retry later. Did that make any sense? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, this is okay. Uh, three months ago, it should have been there. Uh, I think I think it was in 1.2, so maybe around September. Yeah, so, so that supports state script. So um, there is a documentation section about it, but if you're... Um, yeah, uh, so they're on the, on the client side. Um, there is some docs about it under artifacts here. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of states and then you can add scripts before and after the states. And one use case is to, to control when the update happens uh, using the scripts. So, so that's, that's one way to do it right now. Um, we do want to look at also schedules of updates on the server side, which I think would be a better uh, solution for you. But, but it's possible using these state scripts as well. And uh, the, yeah. And then you can also use the local time zone of the devices to, um, to know uh, when to deploy the updates. So there's one, like C specifically, you probably should, should do one before artifact in, or f before download. I have to think a little bit about where exactly to place your check, but, but it's possible and it's documented here. Yes. Yeah, so there's a return code that you can... 
Uh, you can do that too. So you can, uh, there's two ways you can, s or three outcomes. So you can say um, continue, or you can say fail, uh, and then it will abort and roll back. Or you can say retry later, and then you can configure how long uh, until next attempt, basically. So, so it's possible. Uh, yep. Yeah. So you've got, you've got a Linux device and you've got potentially hundreds of microcontrollers yep. running anything from, you know, from you know, DRM to free hard to maybe microcontrollers. Yep. Does vendor uh, downstream work or do you have any plans to have tools for supporting downstream devices? We have plans to support them, uh, but we don't do it yet. So the only way to do it currently is with this script, so you can couple like an update to the Linux device with updates to um, to other devices that are, are close by. Um, but uh, we are planning to, to implement better support for that probably next year, I would say. Yep. Okay. Uh, they are requested, so there is no open port on the devices on the clients themselves, and uh, they go over HTTPS and they ask the server. They they hit a specific endpoint and they check, and they provide their identity, and then the server will respond whether or not there is an update. Uh, a a partial license, yeah. So a partial license is for everything. Yep. So it's fully open source. And, yep. Um, in the picture, how do you update the base core packages and the base kernel? Can you, or is it only the root file system that you update? Yeah. So it depends on how you structure the um, partitions. So we recommend. Oh, let's see if the picture is here. Yeah. Um, so you can update anything inside this root file system partition. Uh, how how to do it? No, uh, no. So just the one here, like, yeah. And then what we typically do is to place the kernel there as well, so you can update that. Um, uh, we we've seen some interest for updating the bootloader, but it's maybe like five percent want it because, <laughs> yeah, they don't want to break it. But um, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Mm. Right. Yeah, so how, how can we uh, enable factory resets? So um, at least until now, we've considered that more of a system integration item, so we, we don't cover that, like you say, in our docs or anywhere. Um, so what you probably ended up doing is added another partition here that had the, the oldest, or the factory image. Um, and we don't currently have any plans to, to um, yeah, to, to support factory resets directly in Mender, but we can talk afterwards and maybe there's a good path for doing that. that makes sense. Yep, so you can do layering uh, if you're a file system. So we try to be very generic and careful not to um, to require any specific technology, but um, that's also a good point. Uh, and this is partly also why why it's why we currently at least consider it more of a system integration thing that you know you're using overlayFS and therefore you can use that. But.
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's still planned. Uh, um, so Delta is right now. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're planning in the short term. But um, uh, yeah, we will get there. It's uh, just a matter of priorities at the moment. Um, okay. Any other questions at this point? No. All right. Let's see if we have a. Yeah, we have a failed update. Um, so, in this case, the you would get um, a pass deployment here, obviously, and then you can see what happened. I just had one device here, and it was it failed, but it, the device came back up. So now it has rebooted twice. It rebooted, it wrote the update, and it rebooted into it, and or it might have rebooted into it, um, and then. It, it rolled back. So it's still in a working condition here. Uh, and it reported to the server what happened. But this is quite detailed. Um, you can see the log. Let me see if I can open this. Um, yeah, so this is the log from the Mender client. It's quite a lot of data. But um, let me see what happened. All right. Yes. There's the. Magic message. Yeah, so I built a root file system that was too big. Um, so I have to build another one. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is uh, how it can fail sometimes. And um, <laughs> um, and this is how you would, would figure it out. So each device would uh, create a, a log and then upload it to the server if it fails. We don't upload logs if it's successful because they're Maybe not that interesting. Let me see. Yep. Uh, so there are groups. Um, let me see. If this will work. Yep. So I put. Um, I put my only device in the test group, um, but you can obviously add more here and then have a production group as well. So now, once you do it the correct way and deploy it to test first, uh, you should be able to catch this. So, uh, and we only allow, this has like been a little bit of a debate, but we only allow a device to be in one group at a time because uh, if, you, if you happen to add it to both test and production, it might have some interesting uh, side effects. Uh, so it's some people would like that, but currently we've been managing to <laughs> keep it like this. Um, all right. So a little bit on what we're working on right now. Uh, how many of you know U-Boot or have done some work in U-Boot? OK. You are U-Boot experts. Almost all of you. Uh, so we all also work with some people that don't know U-Boot that well. And we do require some integration with U-Boot in order to handle the um, partition switching. I think, Mercer, you will give a talk about uh, this later. And. Um, it is difficult, like if you're coming from a more uh, application level background and you, you're suddenly in this U-boot world. Uh, so, so we're working on simplifying this work. Um, so we have some automated patching already. And then how many of you have integrated a board with Mender? Is that two, three, four? OK. And one thing we were thinking is that uh, there are a lot of people doing this, and there's nobody sharing it. So um, do you think you, it would make sense for you to, to share it back to the community? Or do you think it's like a, more of a proprietary thing that you? Hmm. Yep. Um, it's, it's challenging because a lot of proprietary 
Yeah. So you don't think you would be allowed to share? Uh, I'd would you? Yeah, I mean, in that case, I mean, yep. I think where I could. Yep. 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 And it was just a completely a few years of mindset to just say, hey, why don't you share? Maybe it'll work for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, easier to maintain also. That's. Uh, um, what about you? Do you think you could share your integration you did with Mender or? No. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Okay, great. And do you think uh, other people would be interested in seeing like what you did with Mender there, or, like how you integrated that into your board? And do you think that would make sense to share that part? With... Okay, that's great. Yep. Okay, that's great. Yeah. But uh, you are again the experts, so there's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so okay, cool. Yeah, so that's one area we're looking to just create a separate uh, set of documentation and, and readmes where we would basically index uh, the board uh, the Mender integrations that people do, and uh, it's somewhat similar to the um, Yocto in uh, meta layer index. We were thinking something similar. If you put it in your GitHub, we would index it, and then um, do you think that would make sense, or? Yeah. I, I guess, I mean, maybe YAML format or something, like what is YAML recipe? Yeah. Kind of Run, yeah. yeah. Yeah, makes sense. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, get something going there pretty soon. Uh, and another thing is that uh, uh, we're also thinking about uh, CI, so maintaining these integrations over time. Uh, so um, having a way for the community to hook up to our CI server, so you, we would run all the tests on your integration. And then you would get an output afterwards. Uh, if it's failed, you'd get an email, you'd get a log, and you can maintain it over time. So. Yep. Um, where you might get more uh, bigger machines and you can integrate your own thing into it and you know, sort of you can have a little value added so you can make a little cash hmm. to support yourself. So you yep. can almost have an add on in addition to the free. You would you have a for pay uh, for those people that want to use your service and you can actually give back. Yeah, that's a great idea. Cool. So uh, you'll see some something about this pretty soon. Uh, and then we're looking at other ways we can integrate with boards as well. Um, we're experimenting a little bit with UEFI uh, on how you can actually use that to do the partition selection, so you don't need to do any patching at all. Uh, it's quite technical, but you can U-Boot actually has UEFI emulator, so you can use that, and on x86, UEFI is supported pretty much everywhere. So you can sort of get one level below U-boot in that sense. Um, and then uh, if, but this is pretty early stage, so we don't know if it's possible. <laughs> but um, if it doesn't work, we were thinking also about a POC mode versus production integration where you wouldn't have all the um, robustness criteria like atomic updates. Um, so in this case, if you're just testing Mender out on some board, you can easily do that. But if you want to bring it to production, you have to do the integration. Um, and then finally, um, we want to have some way to do binary post-processing also in order to support Mender. So if you have an image already, uh, have some tool that can repartition it for you, insert the, um, make sure that you can do the partition switching. So if, if all this is binary and there is no need to do source patching. We can also build a tool that just takes your existing image and, and builds it into a SD image um, that can, 
that includes Mender and the, and the partitions that you need. So these are some of the things we're working on right now. Does it make sense, or do you have any other ideas how we can do the integration easier? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. This is actually a fairly common problem. You saw it in the demo here as well. So it's too big. Makes sense. Okay. And then uh, in terms of um, platforms, we're looking at x86. So. Um, this is not that well supported by U-Boot. It's supposed to work, but it doesn't always. So uh, maybe we need to look a bit into Grub. And then there's also other um, systems than Yocto, of course, that are in use uh, on Linux. Um, Debian, Ubuntu, Raspbian are very similar. And then you have Buildroot as well that we will we'll take a look at. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Is there anything? Does it make sense, or do you have any comments? I have not. So I, I, I had and it was uh, on AD, x86 architecture and the, the disposal of problems. Uh, we, we couldn't use Grub or uh, UDFI because uh, you know, you, you need to use CPM, uh, the CLDN and the password. And we ended up having like a small, uh, minimal Linux, no networking, no nothing with a uh, an init script that would process through the vendor logic and then launch the Right. Do you have any ideas on how we could support it better, or? Uh, well, I have certain ideas from, from experience from our project. Pro product was the, the project we work on, but uh, I, I don't see how correct our solution is. Like, it, hmm. it seems correct in terms of security. It's just that I don't know that, that there's a better solution. Yeah. Um, I don't have any information on that. I'm sorry. I haven't worked directly on that, but maybe, yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, but thanks for the input. Okay. Any other thoughts on yep? I had a little bit hard, hard time hearing, but uh, yep. Right. So what we were thinking concretely is that uh, um, when you you first would have to create an integration with uh, Mender on your board, so there is some. Um, some integration with U-Boot in particular. And then uh, we have a checklist that you can run through manually to make sure that that works. So, so then uh, you're in, um, let's say, on your production device. You, you did this integration with Mender, and then you know it works because you did it once. Um, so the idea with the CI is that then, at that point, you can um, you can take one board, uh, one of your production boards, and you can put it 
somewhere it has internet connectivity, but it's isolated from your secret networks. And then you can uh, hook it up to our CI server. So then our CI server would control that board and it will run the latest version of Mender uh, and build that image for your board with your integration. Yeah, so this idea was based on Yocto. So you will provide the sources for the build uh, to this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we would build the entire image. This is what we do already for the reference devices. We have Raspberry Pi 3 and BeagleBone. We have um, we use the sources from Yocto. We start from scratch, build everything, and then there is some trickery to deploying an image on a running system, like reflashing the entire, uh, entire device. So it's a little bit tricky, but. Yeah. 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 So the. Yeah. Yeah, so right now we have zero people that are signed up, so we'll see if it scales up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you're interested and it definitely validates that, it, that we should uh, continue to work on this. But um, probably once we, if we are at a luxury where we have scaling problems in the CI infrastructure, we'll, we'll, we'll handle that, like some caps or maybe some paid version with more resources and, and so. I think there's also a uh, possibility of uh, a way to plug in at the test suite level rather than at the build level. So you could provide the pre yeah. images and then control those tests and that kind of thing from our server. So there's probably multiple ways to handle it to improve the flow. Yep. It's all, I think it's all conceptual at this point. So. Yeah. Mm. You'd rather us to provide the well, entire build, yeah. So it would be the board that you pro, yeah. Mm. Uh, so that we can do the integration yeah, on those. Yep. Yeah, so uh, we have a commercial offering there that you can um, hire, for example, Drew to do it. Um, we So that's basically what we have time to do. I, I, otherwise, it's a bit more opportunistic, so. Yeah, you could. We we haven't. I haven't had that request before, but it's something we'll. Uh, yeah, um, it's it's a good idea, and the reason we have. Yeah. Um, When are we out of time, by the way? Like, is it 11? OK, in three minutes. <laughs> uh, maybe one, one more question. No, we only use groups for that. What were you looking for in particular? Like... OK. So you want to have more, so this is something we have on our roadmap that you can create more dynamic groups as we call them. Uh, so you can base them on attributes on the device itself, uh, for example. And uh, you don't have to put them specifically into a group, they would just show up in that group because they have these characteristics. So that's something we will add.
Yeah, exactly. Yes, that will be part of it. So um, typically the term used for it is campaign management. Yeah, but that's basically you start with 1% and then 5% or these devices, then that devices. And maybe one last question. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, so the um, uh, we do full image updates and uh, we do compress them, so they would be reduced. But this is what uh, the gentleman over there asked about. Uh, delta updates would be a much more efficient approach where you can reduce it maybe in 90% or 80%, uh, but right now with compression you get maybe 50% reduction or something like that. So, but this is something we will uh, will work on. So, yeah, and, and, and we're streaming it right now as well. So you don't need any extra space to store any temporary files or anything like that. It goes directly to your uh, partition. But, um, I think we have to end, but uh, thanks so much uh, for joining, and we have a booth as well, and a couple of other um, events uh, coming up, so feel free to join those, and uh, uh, reach out to me if you have any more feedback or, or, or questions. So thanks a lot for joining. <laughs>